hello and welcome to the very first Shift Book Club. You all know me. Um, I'm journalist, broadcaster and creator of The Shift, Sam Baker. And I'm really happy to have Miriam Taves, the author of the brilliant Fight Night, here with us tonight from Toronto. Well, tonight for us, this afternoon for you. First Night is the first ever Shift Book Club pick. Um, it's, I picked it because it's hilarious, poignant depiction of three generations of women the inimitable nine-year-old Swiv, her pregnant mum and grandma Alvira, equally inimitable actually, and how they coexist, support, struggle and fight together as their lives head towards huge change. Oh, I admit, I fell in, absolutely in love with Swiv, it's, its narrator. And so many people who messaged me today were saying, oh, you have to ask her all about Swiv, I loved Swiv. Um, so uh, Swiv has been suspended from school for following grandma Alvira's advice about fighting. And she's being homeschooled by Elvira, which basically means she's just Elvira's wing kid. Um, and it resulted in my favorite maths lesson ever. So Miriam, if you can forgive me, I just need to read this out because this is, this is my, it's my favorite bit. If it takes five years to kill a guy with prayer and it takes six people a day to pray, then how many prayers of pissed off women praying every day for five years does it take to pray a guy or possibly a member of the Supreme Court to death? <laughs> And uh, Miriam is also, she's written nine books, all of which pretty much have been bestsellers, including All My Puny Sorrows, The Flying Troutmans, and Women Talking, which has been made into a film starring Claire Foy, Jessie Buckley, and one of my big crushes, Frances McDormand. Um, and that will be showing at festivals this autumn. So Miriam, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me here. It's great. So I'm sorry to make you cringe making you sit through all of that. So. No, 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 no. It's, it's all good. Just, you know, set the scene. <laughs> Lovely <laughs> intro. Could you tell us um, a little, just a little bit about the book? Tell us a little bit about the story in your own words. Mm -hmm. Well, as you said, I mean, it's the three generations. Of, there's grandma, um, mom, Mushi, and and Swiv, the nine-year-old narrator. They're living together in Toronto. Um, uh, like Swiv says, grandma has one foot in the grave. She's old. She's got some serious health issues. Um, Mushi is an actress. Um, she's pregnant she's swiv has been kicked out of school and um and her father swiv's father is is gone is absent he's ta he's taken off and and she doesn't know where where he is or if he's ever coming back and the book is, is sort of um a letter you know a kind of letter to him basically just telling tell, telling him about her life their lives uh together together in toronto so why did you want to tell this particular story because it's Forgive me if I'm wrong. It's the first book after Women Talking, isn't it? Mm -hmm. well, well, Women Talking. For those of you, um, I'm I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it, it's um, you know, it was a very it was uh, Women Talking is a book that um is an imagined response to these uh, horrific at attacks, rapes that occurred um that in real life, as they say, in a in a Mennonite colony in Bolivia um, in the early 2000s, and and um. So women talking is um, is basically uh, about a uh, you know a group of women talking uh, in and and uh, trying to figure out what, what their response will be to these uh, to these to these attacks and that that um, as you as you can imagine I mean it was a, it was an, an incredibly um, difficult uh, book to write it was intense it was um, the challenge was I mean hold, holding you know the the women's pain. Um, that that suffering uh in in inside and and you know and attempting to um to create a, a narrative um from that basically and it was um it was really really uh it was a it was the hardest writing experience i've ever had and and obviously you know my experience of it of the difficulty is nothing compared to you know what the actual women um went through um needless to say and and so after having written that and um you know I just really needed to uh write something I needed to I needed to <laughs> relax in a sense I needed to move away from that um that that you know that that dark um horrific the those those events and 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 that uh, that story and so I and I started having grandchildren um uh, so, so, rude question how old are you uh, well I'm 58 
I would and say you are technically have, old enough, yeah. <laughs> I am technically old enough. And uh, I have four grandchildren now, and they came in quick succession. Oh my uh, so my son my son had two, and his partner had had two girls, and then and then my daughter and her partner had two boys. And so, you know, they're all, you know, under the age of four. And and um and I and I wanted to write something for them. I really had them in mind, you know, sort of becoming a grandmother makes you you think, and and um yeah, it's a it's a whole new role. And I wanted to to write something for them something that would make them laugh something that uh, would show them their great grandmother my own mother Elvira who is basically the character of, of grandma in in the book uh, what she's like because she's not going to live forever um, you know she's not going to be around probably in in you know in the lives of my of my grandchildren and she is this incredible life force in our family um, this this rock really you know the the center and uh, and so I wanted to I wanted to write about about her and I wanted to write about some of the stuff the hard stuff that our family my family has gone through because my grandchildren will have questions you know when they get old enough they'll they'll say who who were these people who was this guy and who was this woman you know people in my family who have suffered who have um there's this been suicides and mental illness and um you know countless traumas and and um and I and, and so I wanted to sort of sort of incorporate that into the book as well so you know and craft a kind of narrative around these types of these types of things that's the I guess yeah the reason for writing fight night <laughs> after oh my god uh, that's it's like where do we go where do we go after that no. um <laughs> It's a rambling. No, no, it's it's fan, just fascinating. It just throws up. You've just done that thing, which is like an interviewer's nightmare, where you've done every <laughs> single question. You like touched on them and then shot it's off. So, like, I'm, I, I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> no, <I don't>. yeah. <laughs> um, maybe let's let's start with Swiv then, because mm. she did seem to be much as Grandma Elvira is amazing character. Um, Swiv is she really like I think she really got under the skin and into the hearts of of everybody I've spoken to so far who's read it her voice is so strong how did you get into the head of like a, a nine-year-old mm -hmm. yeah well when I finally decided that yes this was going to be a book written you know from the point of view of a, of a of a kid um I had to figure out you know what what age the kid would be and I mean I I loved writing Swiv I loved sort of in a sense you know becoming Swiv uh, and um you know during the course of writing the book and um I knew uh, for me the age age nine was it was important and and of course the big big challenge was getting that you know that that voice right um nine I, I just thought okay nine year old I mean you know she's still young enough to um be very you know um naive I mean she's innocent she's very squeamish and horrified by any talk you know of the body and of bodily functions and sex and birth and all of that uh stuff that she you know is horrified and and of course her her grandma and her mom you know speak freely about it and much to her mortification and um you know but she's old enough to um to start to to observe and to kind of ask questions questions and to uh you know to to understand the answers to these questions as, as well and so and I, I just remember myself at age eight you know I felt like I was this kid I you know I, I just had the kind of the world by the tail I thought in my you know yeah. I, was, I was free I was happy I was playful I was filled with joy um you know nothing bothered me I was carefree and then I turned nine and something happened you know I started like I like I said you know I started just kind of seeing what was going on around me and asking questions and feeling things and becoming a little bit more anxious and yeah. <laughs> yeah. and Swiv too is you know she's a very anxious kid I mean she's a messed up kid her dad has left she's been kicked out of school she's worried about her mother going crazy and killing herself she's worried about her grandma dying um you know Know, she's she's protective of this unborn sibling of hers <laughs> and um you know she's trying to keep it all together uh, and um so she's 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 a, she's a tough she's a tough kid but she's also extremely vulnerable and um and 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 I would say yeah an anxious yeah she's got that brilliant kid thing of just ask ask every question just you know there's no off button except for you like as you say like the body scream mm -hmm. thing <laughs> she's absolutely pretty is she is she a little bit you 
Oh yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, I think absolutely. A little bit me, a little bit um, my daughter, who's an adult now, of course, um, with kids of her own. Uh, and, um, but certainly, you know, yeah, I, w- I would say, I, I would say so a combination of, of myself, especially because I grew up in, I grew up in a, in a community of this, you know, conservative Mennonite religious, you know, kind of cult-like community. So naturally I did have a lot of, you know, I was very, very puzzled by, by things at an early age. And so, you know, that kind of, you know, um, quest questioning and, and anxiety and sort of this uncertainty, this kind of, um, you know, things going on and you're just not sure, you know, what, what is actually happening and you don't necessarily trust the adults around you to, um, to, to tell you. And, um, so yeah, I'd say, yeah, I'd say she was very, she is, yeah, a character that is very much like I, like, like I am, like I was, um, and, and a, and a kid that I can, that I can relate to even in, you know, not, not just in her, in her anxiety, in her, um, fears and uncertainties, but also in her rebelliousness, you know, in her sort of bravado in a sense. And, um, even with her, her physical looks, you know, people are always saying, Oh, I thought you were a boy. I thought it was a boy. Oh, it's a girl, you know, that kind of like disheveled appearance. And, um, and, and also in her protective, her protectiveness about, you know, for, for her family, for her family members. I mean, you know, take, taking care of them, you know, and she's just a kid. Um, I think all of those things are, are things that um, I can definitely relate to. They're all rebellious, aren't they? I mean, is that something, um, I was going to say Elvira is handed down, but I don't know which Elvira I mean. <laughs> yeah, right. The fictional or the real. It's sort of the same. I mean, then that's why I gave, I mean, you know, the character of Elvira in the book is, is definitely, you know, the, the real Elvira in in life. I mean, that's that's who she is. That's how she is. And that's why I gave her the, you know, the, the, the actual name you know, off my mother, off my real mother, whose name is Elvira. And um, so, and yeah, you know, and, and, and Elvira, grandma, you know, is certainly attempting to um, teach Swift, you know, through her actions, she's attempting to show her, you know, like how to live fearlessly in a sense she understands she 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 perceives swiv's anxiety and fears and she's she's attempting to console her to comfort her but um but also to 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 show her how how to you know go forward into into the world into life you know with with a type of courage and joy yeah i mean joy is so important isn't it because that kind of i mean swiv's got all the it's these anxieties and she doesn't know where her dad is and she's worried about her yet to be born baby brother yeah I mean I can't remember actually whether it is definitely a baby brother or she's just decided it's a baby brother (laughs) but it's I mean it's so funny and you and you always use humor to great effect I mean you even did manage to get some humor into women talking which was quite the achievement but is that um is that important to you? Is like being funny? Is that a, is it important to you that your books make people laugh? No, it's not important to me that, that I'm funny or that, or that um, my books m- make people laugh really not at all. It's just simply uh, a function of who I am and of how I see uh, the world. You know, I see the world and if I'm, you know, if my books are just a representation of life, human life, the world, um, you know, I see the world and people as, you know, ridiculous and comical and absurd and, and certainly tragic, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, the, and those two things, you know, I, I just think are always just always, you know, inextricably in, entwined and and go together. I mean, you can't you can't have one without the other. You can't have the light without the shadow, et cetera, et cetera. And and um, and I think that also this was just the role that I was um, I think from from birth. I mean, you know, considering the um, the in my in my family like basically the you know the depression of my father of my sister the mental illness um my mother you know trying to keep everything together i came along i was quite a bit younger six years younger than my older sister and i was sort of left to my own devices very much like swiv is left to my own devices and and um and 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 sort of expected to um kind of you know you know play that play a kind of clown role 
in the family. It was my, my, my most ardent, you know, fervent desire. It was to make my father and my sister, for instance, laugh, you know, because I know, you know, especially when I got older and realized how much pain they were in, how much suffering they were experiencing and despair. And, um, and that sort of from kind of day one was really, you know, my, my role. And I think that's just it's been ex extended into, into life, into my, into my writing again, you know, writing this book with, with an attempt to, to make my grandchildren laugh. So your question was, is it important to me for people to laugh when they read my stuff in this case in fight night? Yeah, I would say, yeah, actually, yes. I said no, but it, but yeah. now that I've mumbled on about it long enough, <laughs> change my answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, quite often when you when you speak to when I or when one speaks to a fiction writers, the worst possible thing you can ask them is, is it based on you? Is it from your life? You know, all those kind of questions. But, mm. you know, you've made no bones about the fact that most of your writing is, is from your life. And mm -hmm. so I don't feel like you're going to turn your camera off on me when we, when we talk about that. But what was it that made me, I know you wrote one memoir, what has it made you write autofiction rather than, if you don't mind it being called autofiction rather than, than memoir? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah, right. And that, that memoir wasn't really a memoir. It wasn't, it was a, it was a book about my father. It was a kind of a nonfiction book about my father, but written in his, in his voice. So there was a sort of fictional kind of quality yeah. to me too. You know, you could say, I mean, I think it was like, it was marketed or whatever and published as, as, as memoirs as and as nonfiction. But I mean, you could say that, you know, by writing, in my father's voice that that's that's fiction i mean all these terms all these labels are you know i sort of useless uh, on mm -hmm. the on the one hand but of course help us to figure out what it is what we're reading and how to market the thing but but um yeah i don't know i mean i don't think i ever really i tried when i first started writing i, I you know and i've said this before in interviews I, I was really trying i was i was just 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 crazy about toni morrison i uh, still am and and her right and her writing and i was reading everything by her i just discovered her and i thought okay i want to write like tony you know toni morrison and so i actually made the i, I attempted to which of course is you know I failed. <laughs> well, and, and high, you know. <laughs> exactly. Go big or go home, right? <laughs> so yeah, so I tried, failed, and uh, and then you know, kind of realized that in, in fact I would have to you know write more about you know what I what I knew as a, as a cliche goes, and and um, and then it just I I tried writing in the third person, for instance, and I try. I think some of my earlier stuff is more. Um, I don't know what the word would be disguised in a sense. I mean, I think all writers j use their own lives and their own experiences mm. and their own thoughts. You know, a lot of a lot of us will deny that, but but I think ultimately that's always you know the, at the core. I mean, that you know the germ of you know what, whatever of all of all of our writing. So I just realized that I was comfortable doing that in the for writing in the first person, using my life, using my stuff, you know, and and um trying to make sense of my own experiences as a human being. Um by by shaping by crafting narrative from them by shaping shaping all of that stuff in into something that made sense to me and something that I could you know, take outside of me and, and put there. And, and so in a sense, you know, again, the next question is, oh, is it therapeutic? And, you know, you could say, yeah, it's therapeutic. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully it's something artful too, you know, yeah, yeah. crafting, crafting, crafting the narrative and using language. Um, but, um, but it just felt like it was the only way that I could write. It was the only thing that I, the only things, you know, that I, that I wanted to write were, were the books that I wrote. And, and it's true that most of them sort of, um, you know, spring from my own experiences in life. And, well. yeah, so how, um, cause you don't give the Mennonite community an easy ride by, by any, stretch how have you had trouble have you have there, has there been difficulty with them have i had death threats have i had mennonites coming after me with pitchforks and <laughs> well that wasn't what i was asking but you know <laughs> have you <laughs> of course i mean no not not to that <laughs> not to that um extreme obviously but i mean occasionally after women talking came out i was i thought for a while there 
I mean, I might have been losing my mind briefly after the after the experience of writing it. And I thought for a while there, I thought that, you know, there was some conservative, you know, elders from my own community or other communities, you know, stalking, stalking me. Cause for sure there's there's the, the um anyway, I don't think that was the case, but but um <laughs> I was a little bit nervous. You know, you imagine, the, you know, all those cars, the black cars, you know, pulling up in front of the house, which did happen when when I was a kid, you know, and, and all of the church elders getting out, coming to the house to, um, you know, to basically tell you that what you're doing, what what you have done, you know, whatever it is, is is wrong, is sinful, and the church has, has been made aware of this, and you're in trouble. And um and and so that's kind of, that kind of uh, disapproval um, is something that I've experienced all my life, you know. And for the most part, it's the it's a it's a kind of a tight lipped disapproval, um, a sort of silent condemnation of you know um, me asking you know who who do I think I am? Why am I telling these stories? Why am I airing you know this? dirty laundry for instance why am I not talking about the good things about being a Mennonite um which I think I do uh, often but you know it's um I I've I've received um yeah yeah there there is there's anger uh there but really you know there's far more support from from the Mennonite community than um than than condemnation and even from some very very conservative uh, congregations, for instance, and colonies, um, you know, word coming out from from these places, uh, you know, has been has been um, supportive and and um, and I'm grateful and I'm grateful for that. And and like I've been saying from the very beginning, you know, that it's not the Mennonite people that I'm critical of. Um, Mennonites, I'm a Mennonite, and you know, my the people I love most in this world are Mennonites, and and um, and I have fond memories of my Mennonite community, absolutely, and I miss it, and I think about it every single day. But but um, you know, it's that it's that culture of control. It's that that um, that fundamentalism. You know, the 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 Mennonite you know hierarchy, the patriarchy, the 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 church, the power, you know, the oppression of, of, uh, girls and women, especially in these communities, the silencing, you know, uh, the discipline, the punishment, the shame, all of these aspects, you know, uh, of that, of the Mennonite culture, you know, not the Mennonite faith, the Mennonite faith is, is in and of itself a beautiful thing, you know, it's difficult to see where it's being practiced, <laughs> uh, but you know, in theory, <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> well, and the whole, you know, the control and fundamentalism that you refer to is hardly exclusive to that particular religion. Let's face right. it. I mean, what's what's happening now? You know, uh, in in the states, but everywhere. I mean, this is not. There's in the UK. There's a whole strand of thought going. Oh, it couldn't happen here. And you're like, well, it can happen yeah. there. It can happen here. You know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. You know, the fight's not over. Not by an, any stretch at all. Um. So you've got talking of fighting. You've got Grandma Elvira in your corner, anyway. <laughs> I do. I do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, de definitely. Like I say, you know, that that rock uh, in our family, you know, her resilience and her strength and, you know, um, especially, you know, with everything that all, all of the uh, the loss and the death and the madness and the, you know, the everything that she, that she's um, experienced in life and and um, has fought through to f to live with, you know, with joy and with courage and 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 love you know and 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 um and so she's a real she's she's for me i mean she's you know she's a role a role model and um i i you know can only hope to have absorbed some of that you know at some point you know what well, it's so it's this is a gross generalization but so often when you speak to writers and i say that as a writer about their mothers it's like they're insp inspired by them in but in like the completely converse mm -hmm. way to the one you've just described certainly mm -hmm. um the other character of course is put the poor mum who barely gets you know we haven't even given her a little mention 
but she's <laughs> she does because Swiv and Elvira are such incredible presences. She almost she's almost squeezed not squeezed out, but she certainly mm -hmm. doesn't get the doesn't get the airtime because it just seems like there's not that there's just not quite enough room for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, she's out there, you know, she like it is basically yeah, the Swiv and Swiv and Grandma show because, you know, mom Mushi is out there um, trying to make a living, trying to, um, you know, get get work. Um, she's pregnant. She's exhausted. She's um, she's also freaked out, just like Swiv is, you know, she's lost her sister and her and um and uh father to, to suicide her her husband you know or at least the father of her kids has you know taken off and so she's under an incredible incredible degree of uh, stress and strain and and uh pressure um to sort of keep this whole thing going and to keep herself going and um she feels guilty as a mother she feels guilty as a daughter she's she feels that she's not doing enough for elvira for swiv for her unborn baby she doesn't necessarily want to be pregnant. Um, she feels guilty about that. She is afraid that she'll lose her mind, you know, that this is something that she'll have inherited, you know, some genetic thing. And, and, um, and I, and I think that that is something that people who, who understand, you know, and mm -hmm. who have lived with, uh, either themselves or, you know, their loved ones with, with mental illness. I mean, that fear, that pervasive fear, you know, is, is something real and, and, um, so, yeah. And in a sense, too, I mean, you know, years ago when um, now here, there are four generations of people here in my family. We're all living together kind of under the same roof, more, more or less, which is kind of crazy, um, but good um, for the most part. And and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, but 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 initially it was my mother myself and my daughter who moved to you know this house and and um so in a sense you know I was kind of the the mushy character if I'm thinking of you know mm. those three generations and then applying them to to the book to to fight night and um so when you said you know it was I like Swiv or are there aspects of Swiv that are like me I would say yeah absolutely but also also um you know the mom for sure feeling also, kind of like okay having to you know like yeah being in this like you say in this role of you know just constant pressure to to you know the the life of, of a woman in her you know mid -age, middle age you, you know you're doing everything you're attempting to do everything and failing in your own mind at doing everything and then feeling guilty about, you know, not having done everything, but feeling the pressure. I mean, it's a difficult, crazy time, I think, in a woman's life, middle age. It's like a permanent <laughs> state of uh, underachieving and feeling bad about it. Ex and feeling bad about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's so true. So do both of your kids and their partners and their children live with you? Or just your no, daughter? No, 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 my daughter and her partner and kids live on the second floor of that bigger house. And my mother lives on the main floor of that bigger house that I'm pointing to out there. And then my part, my partner and I had this tiny little laneway house built. It's really small too, so that, you know, so that we could move into it. And, and so that my daughter- So you could move out basically. We moved out into the backyard, like a garden shed. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit bigger than that. And, um, but there's no way that my daughter and her partner could afford. I don't know if you know about Toronto. It's like London. It's like New York. I mean, there's just no way that young people, um, you know, can new young families can can afford can afford to to buy anything and barely to to rent around here. You know, in this part of Toronto and in Toronto in general. So so it's all worked out. We all take care of each other, and we all. My mother right now has gone to Albany, New York, on a road trip for a Scrabble tournament. So, oh my god. Yeah, How yeah. Elvira, so, Elvira, El, yeah, Elvira's gone. She's like she, today the tournament starts, and my sister-in-law, my partner's sister, went went with her. So they're both, you know, doing doing the Scrabble tournament. Demon Scrabbler, pardon? Demon Scrabble player. Did you ask? Sorry, you cut out a little bit. Is she a demon Scrabble player? Oh, my mom. Yeah, she's yeah. a yeah. She's She's a total demon. I mean, she's super competitive. I mean, she's cutthroat, yeah. you know, like she's, yeah. Focused, she's, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so my sister-in-law is her, or my mother is, you know, my sister-in-law's mentor, really her kind of protege. And, and so they've gone to this tournament together and my mother will be playing at a certain level and my sister-in-law will be playing at the, you know, the very beginner, beginner level. And, and, um, 
yeah, they stay in a hotel, you know, there's going to be a lot of people there that my mom has known from over, over the years, these kind of professional Scrabble players, you know, oh you can make a little, you can, you, can, you can make some money. You can make, you know, a little bit of money sometimes, you know, if you win. Oh God. And I bet it gets really like needly if you disagree about whether a word's a word. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, these are official, you know, they, it has to be in the Scrabble dictionary in the, in the <laughs> sanctioned official Scrabble dictionary and they're, they're timed too, right? They have their clocks and, you know, every, each player has only 20 minutes um, for their entire game. So, you know, you're timing yourself with every, with every move and, and um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's intense. It's crazy. I, uh, I've, I've been to these tournaments with my mother and um, I mean, she's just exhausted. I mean, she's almost 90 years old. She's just exhausted at the end of these things. God, she is incredible. Did she, what does she think of her, your, you know, portrayal of her? Did she, was she flattered? Did she tell you what you got wrong? You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she just laughs. She just laughs and, and you know, she's sort of like, oh my God, I can't believe you wrote, you know, and, and she, she kind of loves, she kind of loves it. Um, but she, she definitely, you know, is my, is my biggest fan. And, and um, it's so funny because every few years when I have a book out, you, you know, because for the most part, I mean, all she reads are whodunits. Now she is in a book club where she's expected to read all these sort of serious, you know, books. And so she's, she's going along with that because she likes the socializing part of it and the food yeah. and social, you know, okay, I'll read some, you know, Alexevich and, you know, and that, and that sort of thing. <laughs> um, but, but um, for the most part, she reads who done it. So when I have a book out, you know, of course she'll read it and uh, you know, sort of, but, but, you know, I, I can tell that it's sort of not a chore necessarily, but, you know, a sort a sort of, um, you know, oh, okay. You, you know, she's used to it. I mean, I've been writing about her and ask, you know, she's been a, a kind of character in some mm. way form in, in so much of my work that, you know, she's used to it. And I check in with her and I check in with other members of my family too. You know, I'll say like, Hey, listen, how do you feel about all of this? Are you feeling, you know, is this you're too close to home? Cause I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to write anything that would, you know, be something uh, that they wouldn't want, you know, made public, even though it is a fiction. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a kind of a, a kind of a, a challenge, a challenge in that way, you know, not, yeah. not, not, not digging to. Yeah. And does she cut her whodunits into sections? Yeah, she does. She used to do it a lot more. She used to do it a lot more so with her friend Doris, because, you know, she and Doris would exchange whodunits all the time. And of course, you know, they just had their, their little handbags and they didn't have room for big, giant, heavy, heavy books. So, yeah, they would slice them up and exchange, you know, OK, you've read this one here. I'll take this one and yeah, make yeah. them Reader's Digest size. About hey, that yeah. <laughs> People are horrified by that. I think it's funny, but a lot of people are just horrified that, you know, that they would carve up these books. Well, it's just practical, you know. Um, exactly. I've seen you describe all of your novels as one big book. Mm. What do you what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think just kind of one leads into the next. I think again, it's just trying to keep up with this the, again, you know, my my experiences as a human being and and sort of you, you know again you know, shaping that into some kind of coherent uh narrative some story um and um I you know I guess I've often felt oh I, I wish I wish I had more of an imagination and could uh, attempt <laughs> attempt to you know do something but yeah really I mean I write about the same things over and over I write about the same themes I write about the same types of people um so in that way um you know, just the, a few things have changed, a few things are altered here and there. But, you know, I obviously have a place where I where I go in my head. I have, you know, I have these um, things that haunt me, um, you know, and um, things that inspire me, things that I have themes that I have questions about that I will always, always, always have questions about, things that enrage me, um, fundamentalism, the, the healthcare system, particularly as it pertains to mental health, um, you know, the suffering of, of, of girls and women in this world. And, you know, and I think that's just, I, I have to accept that that's the stuff that I'm going to write about probably. And, you know, forever. <laughs> um, 
I feel like I should ask you some like sensible questions about writing. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> we should put, put like the the kind of the, the book club head on. Um, it's you've used kind of a letter structure for this particular one, and you always use kind of non traditional structures. Why is that? I think um, the letter, because you know what? Often I was actually yeah thinking thinking about about that often. Um, I need to somehow create a structure for the book um, that will make it necessary to write the book. Do you know what I mean? So mm. lots of my other books are kind of letters or they're assignments or they're um, like- yeah, Like homework, yeah. Like homework, like so for instance, women talking to the, the minutes of these meetings. So we need to take the minutes of these meetings. Well, obviously we don't need to, the story could be told without that structure without that framing device but in my mind and then you know yeah a complicated kindness is like a, a a school assignment that the whole book and even if it even if that's not overtly expressed in the actual book that this is in my you know that this is what this was an assignment or that this is a letter in my mind it is so that in my so that I'm giving myself a, a kind of an assignment and a reason to write the book that I'm writing um if that makes any if that yeah. makes sense and every book that, that I write too I, I feel like there's a uh, a kind of um expressing a little bit of the futility that I feel with, uh, for, with writing that that words fail us in the end that you know that that books that language that story I mean you know we we crave stories we need stories we we write stories we read story we 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 are storytellers that's how we communicate as human beings but that you know ultimately I feel a certain um and this has just been something that has plagued me I guess you could say all of my writing life I just feel a kind of ridiculous um futility in it you know why am I writing like why am I doing this and so um you know if I can give myself a reason so a structure so if I give my main character in this case fight night swim you know my protagonist if I can give her a reason for writing which is giving myself a reason for writing then it's a letter to her father that's that is so interesting and because there's this I think there's this myth about writing that you know you just sit down and the you know the muse comes or you're you know, a number of people who I've spoken to who've said, you know, you just, you just, you know, basically you put your bum on the seat and you sit there and you do 2000 words. And yes, that is true, but it's just not that easy, is it? Do you find it easy or hard or? Both. Okay. I mean, sometimes when it's flowing, you know, there's nothing better in the world, you know, the feeling and the, the relief, um, you know, I've, I've realized that I need to write whether I, I don't, you know, whether I need to publish or not, you know, that that's a, that's a whole other question, you know, I need to make a living, but, um, but I definitely, definitely do need to write. It's just the act of writing. It's the act of, you know, yeah, using language to shape experience and, and to soothe the soul and the mind. I don't know. I, I think that it is hard. It's hard. It's, it's, it's sometimes very hard. I mean, I, I get, I, I get writer's block and, you, you know, the, just, I mean, e endless, you know, staring at a, at a blank screen or page with, with nothing and nothing happening. And, and in that way, it's agonizing. Um, but when it, you know, when it, when it actually comes and, and I think for me too, it's just giving myself permission and maybe um, again, I mean, I, you know, that comes from, I mean, w when I grew up, where I grew up and when I grew up, um, we just weren't supposed to be doing this, particularly, you know, females, you know, girls and, you know, writing thing, you, you know, I'm going to write something for you and I'm going to, you know, you're going to read it and you're going to, I mean, the, the vanity of that, you know, the, um, the subversiveness of that. I mean, it was just something that wasn't, I didn't even think that was a thing, you know, that a person could do. And, and um, so, so, and then you know the famous Alice Munro you know who do you think you are I mean who do you think you are writing you know why would you think that your story you know your experiences are something that you know are worthwhile to to read or, or would make any difference you know all, all of that doubt I mean I feel it all the time all the time and um 
so I think to give oneself permission to do it is, is half the is half the battle or 90 percent of the battle yeah did you get did any one person or one incident give you the impetus to write or permission if you like yeah um I, I mean, my father was a, was a teacher. He was a, he was a school teacher and he, he believed, um, you know, deeply in, in, in reading and, and writing. And he would give me a sign. He would, he would actually give me assignments when I was a kid, if I was bored, um, you know, he'd say, well, why don't you write, you know, half a page of whatever you want to, whatever you want to write. And sometimes, you know, most of the time I, I wouldn't do it. I would immediately find something better to do, but, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but some, sometimes I, I would do it and he'd, he'd always um, mark it and pretend to be sort of pouring over it and really thinking, hmm, you know, and then inevitably give me an A or an A plus, oh, you know, you know it, was so. just a, it was just a shtick. I mean, you know, the, I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, the writing was horrible, but, but um, it was, that happened early on in, in my life. And so, you know, I knew that, I knew that my father even though he was a member of this, you know, community, obviously, and a very devout member um, and pious, you know, he still, you know, he, he, he believed and he, he nurtured that in, in me, you know, he, he believed in me and, in, and in the, and in the, the need and the necessity and the, the importance, you know, the, the, the worth of, of, of writing something down. Are you tempted by other mediums or is it about words on a page for you? Well, you know, probably about a, like a hundred years ago, I would have loved to have had, you know, rather have been a, a dancer, you know, or, or maybe a, <laughs> a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> you know, gone to Hollywood and um you know when I was fantasizing as a, as a kid um certainly you know my impression you know the the idea of being a writer you know being at home with my you know didn't didn't isn't some isn't the way I saw myself in, in the world <laughs> as a as a kid and as a teenager and I and I was I I studied uh, film studies, actually. I had really wanted to make make movies, but um, the reality of that just seemed so uh, overwhelming and impossible. And um, so, I don't know. I mean, I've tried to write other things. And, you, you know, even just like, yeah, okay, so writing, but even just the novel. I mean, I've tried writing other things like, you know, poetry or, you know, a short story or something like that. And, and um these, these these are specific art forms and and um i think you know i uh, there's something about just the novel that uh you know is for me the natural thing i can't you, do anything were you involved in the screenplay for women talking no not really i mean they had asked me if i wanted to you know be to write with together with um sarah uh polly the the writer and and, and director and i absolutely didn't um but yeah. you know she, she and and she did an amazing job and and um you know so i, I think what do they have me listed as uh, you know kind of whatever that consultant you know uh, occasionally sarah would have questions and then we would talk yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no I didn't do the writing that's her that her. sounds like my kind of screenwriting I've got to say <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah yeah exactly yeah. so um just for um anybody listening if you've got any questions pop them in the chat box um and I'll ask Miriam I can see yours there already Tanya um are you what's your writing process are you a, a planner or are you just a wing it person well, I'm a big, big, big planner. Um, I think planning is for me the the biggest kind of phase of the of, of the whole thing. I take um, just countless. I make notes and notes and notes and plan and you know think and sort of um, not not mapping it out or anything like that. You know because I like the freedom and the kind of messiness, for lack of a better term, of the of the novel to be to be able to meander and go wherever um which you can't do in a screenplay really uh just because there are you know time limits and budget restrictions but but it's um the freedom of the yeah so I don't know I mean I do plan a lot I fill notebooks and notebooks with stuff and with you know bits of uh 
dialogue that I bits of dialogue that I hear along the way or characteristics or details or and themes and you know things pertaining to the themes that I tr trying to circling around and around and around and around and trying to get to that big the big question that is at the uh, is at the heart of I think everything that I write and obviously I don't have any answers but if I can at least identify the question <laughs> you know mm -hmm. that's a start <laughs> and um yeah, but I spend, and then the actual writing is, um, it's a far less time actually than, than the planning mm. generally. Yeah. Um, and what was the, the critical question for fight night? Yeah, I think, I think the the critical question for, for fight night was, you know, how does, what, what is Swift trying to say about her? about her world how to, how to swive you know how to swive define her life and you know and then and then of course and why why is she choosing to write what she writes why is she trying to tell her father this happened and this happened and this happened you know because she's in she's she's attempting to empower herself she's attempting to um to 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 kind of gird her loins in a sense yeah. <laughs> so, um you know knowing that you know the shit's about the shit storm is about to you know come i mean you know her grandmother will die you know swift knows this even though she's you know at age nine able to sort of deny this a little bit as we all are about death um to, you know to a point and um you know and and there's going to be a baby you know there's going to th th all of this stuff is going to happen and there's no um no sense that her father will ever return you know so so swift is attempting to you know to to empower herself to um our arm arm herself in, in a sense and and that's what she's working through and that's why she's choosing to write about the things that she's writing about about her mother about her grandmother um in order to you know to to be able to um to survive to live life the question here from well several questions here from tanya um i'm not sure where to start with them all um where do you i'm going to just throw them all in together really so where do you go to write and what's your process in terms of you know how how do you write in the course of a day or a week or a time of day you know that kind of thing how do you structure your writing i always write in the morning and i have quite a quite a you know sort of uh severe rituals probably too strong strong a word but um you know get up make coffee read the newspaper do the sudoku this has become an important part of my you know yeah. procrastination ritual maybe um sometimes i do the wordle these two things the sudoku and the wordle anyway you know kind of like focusing my thoughts focusing 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 and then i start writing and i'll, I'll write for my work here where where i am right now here in the dining room and the or this is all one room one small room like i say we're living in the garden shed and or i'll go or i'll go upstairs there's a little room there where i work i always work at home um I'm always envious of people who can work in cafes and stuff like that, but I can't. And I, uh, you know, my, my family, all generations of them here know that I'm working and they don't bug me usually. And, and, um, and then I'll work for maybe, I don't know, two or three hours. You don't have a, you don't have one of those things like I have to do this many words and I can't get up from this spot until I've done it or anything like that. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I do, especially when I feel that I, I'm not getting anywhere. And um, and especially towards the end of writing, writing a book, I think, OK, like, let's just like I will set those word word, you know, count limits on, mm. on myself for sure and try and try and try and meet them. And then sometimes, you know, I'll make it really, really short, like, OK, I just have to write 200 words today, like one <laughs> you know, yeah. paragraph, basically, so that it's so that it's actually something that I can accomplish, you know. Just it's so, so good in in you know setting these crazy expectations for yourself of like oh yeah I'm gonna write you know two thousand words today I mean you'll just feel like a failure at the end I, I would anyway because that's impossible for me yeah totally setting yourself up for the these unachievable goals every day 
And yeah. do you and like uh, do you use anything? Like, are you one of those people who and I can't remember the name of the software now. What's that software that everyone uses? Can you remember? You know, you the mean one where, the, the, where they turn off the internet and all that? Or oh no, do you use that? Freedom. No, no, oh, yeah. I don't. No, I've heard of it. Yeah, I should uh, probably. Uh, is it Scrivener? I think it's Scrivener, but that might be the screenwriters imposing their ideas onto the novel writers, you know, with yeah. the little the digital post-it note things that you move around. I can't get my head around it, but some people swear by it. I can't do that. I don't do that. I mean, I've been doing this for a while and I'm a little bit old now. And so I'm pretty old yeah. school. As well. And I am, um, I am, um, in fact, with editing, you know how with edits, a lot of people use like the, uh, what is that called? Track changes, you know, in the, yeah. in the margins. Yeah, I don't even do it like that. My editor writes everything uh, with a pencil on on the, on the pages, on the hard copy of the pages, and, and gives them to me. And then I oh, make changes, and then we go back and forth like that. And and so you know, I'm so grateful to her for doing this because it's not how she prefers to to work anymore. But I can't no, do it anymore. You're the boss. You're the author. <laughs> Yeah, exactly that face. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how, how long I can get away with that. Um, Catherine has asked, when you draw so heavily from your own life, how do you decide where the boundaries are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that that is, and that's why I continue to check in with, you know, with, with my family. I mean, for instance, um, I, I haven't written a, a lot about... Um, you know, um, my, well, for, first of all, I feel as though I'm, I'm writing with, with love and, and with, um, a, a type of, um, uh, honesty in terms of like, just, well, just that, or, uh, I mean, yeah, with, with, with love. I mean, you know, I generally, the, the characters in my book who are not lovable are, 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 are not really people that I know, um, you know, they're, or their systems, or they're the, they're the man, you know, they're the, <laughs> they're the patriarchy, they're the elders of the church, they're the, you know, the, the whoever, whoever these people are that wield power over us, and there are many of them, of course, um, you know, and it's, it's systems, and, and, um, and the individuals, though, you know, I hope that they're portraying you know, the kind of humanity that they, um, you know, inhabit and and um, and that I'm writing them with love. And so, for instance, my kids, um, I think, you know, I, I don't think a lot of readers would be able to say, oh, I know exactly what her kids are like. No. You know, so, 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 you know, and like, for, like, for instance, my, my, my daughter um, has, has written a book now, it's called Hey, Good Luck Out There. And it's all about her experiences, um, you know, uh, with addiction and rehab and and uh, and now and then and then you know um trying to find a life make a life uh as a as a sober straight um uh, person which she has managed to do all power to her and uh and it was it was i mean it was it was it was a devastating time in our in our lives and uh it, we're just you know amazed and happy that she's here and uh and and uh doing so well and and um you know, that's something that I, I would never have written about. She's written her own book about it, you know, and so yeah. now I can talk about it, but it's something that I wouldn't have talked about. It's something that I wouldn't have written about and other things like that, you know, and, and the deep pr private pain or anguish that, um, you know, um, that perhaps that my kids or, or people that I, you know, that are still alive will have experienced when I was writing about my sister after she died or my father after she died, characters that are based on them, you know, they, they, they were gone. And, and, and so, of course, I would prefer that, you know, that they were here, and then I wouldn't write about, uh, write about them in that way. But, um, you know, they're not. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so that was very much her story, not your story, really. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Catherine also asked uh, if you're ever tempted to, uh, I guess, wish fulfillment, if you're ever tempted to fix things that didn't work out in your the, fiction. Oh, you know what? That's an interesting question because 
it's so funny what happens when I'm finished with a book, even though, you know, you just like your whole body and mind and everything is so wrapped up in it when you're working on it and fixing and changing up to the last minute, up to the last minute, you know, just small things, you know, phoning my editor late at night. Okay. We got to change, you know, I got to put this comma here, not there. Just these small things that I obsess over and, and, and I just like everything mean everything to me in that moment when it's finally done when it's, when it's finished and it's off to the, you know, and there's nothing that I can do anymore. I really, I really stop thinking about it really other than when I'm, you know, doing interviews like this or talking about it. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I can look at some of my earlier work, which I don't, but I mean, I could read some of my, you know, and, and, um, but I think about it and I think, oh, wow. Okay. Okay. But, you know, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> it could be better. <laughs> It could be worse, I guess, but, you know, definitely could be better. And I mean, there's always ways of, of improving and, and making something, something better, but, you know, I think, I, th I guess nothing would ever get finished if. No, you just be constantly editing and editing and editing and editing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Elaine has asked, how did you, so you get up in the morning and you have your coffee and you do your Sudoku and you do your Wordle and then you sit down and all of a sudden you're on like nine years old. How do you do that? How do you switch into that mindset? Yeah, I sometimes, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, it, yeah, because it kind of it sounds kind of psychotic, um, <laughs> but it's it sort of, um, it's like playing a role in a sense, you know, like as a, and, you know, and, and that is kind of why I'm, you know, part of the reason why I made Mushi the mother of fighting at an actress. I mean, it is kind of like you're playing a, a role. You, so I, I can become Swiv. Um, yeah, I can become a nine-year-old and, you know, but, but, but obviously only a part of me because I'm still having to, you know, write uh, the nine-year-old, <laughs> not just be the nine-year-old, but, but, um, I, it's um I think well part of it the beginnings the beginnings are obviously very very hard and that 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 is a sort of you know impossible situation where it's like okay I'm gonna start the book as a you know mm. nine year old protagonist like oh my god you know the paralysis that comes from like yeah that's that's very very tough but then once once that's there then when I open my computer after the coffee and the Sudoku and I see what is already there. And I do mm. that old, old trick that ever that, you know, that one of the oldest tricks in the book is like, I'll, I'll stop writing every day in the middle of a, of a scene. I say, you do know? you do that? Yeah. Literally stop yeah. in the middle. So, yeah. 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 There are a lot of tricks that I don't even bother with people, you know, advice that writers over the ages have, have, um, you know, imparted upon us, but and that is one of what, that I follow and, and I find it really works. And so if I open my computer, I mean, I'm already there and in, in the middle of the scene. So then it's, you know, yeah, it's a little bit what, easier than you to get in, morph into the nine-year-old. What's the worst bit for you? Is it that kind of when it's a blank page at the beginning or is it, you know, some people say, oh, my God, the worst bit's 20,000 words. I hate that yeah. because it hasn't started yet. Or with some people actually find it harder later on. I mean, for me, I hate that 20,000 word bit. What about you? Yeah, that's a good question. It's sort of sort of like running a marathon, right? You know, when do you hit that mm -hmm. wall? And when is that? When does the energy lag and, you know, the middle sag and all, all of that stuff? I mean, and it, yeah, it. <laughs> That, that's that's a really interesting question actually i i haven't um yeah certainly i mean ge general often this isn't necessarily answering the question but often what happens to me in the course of writing is i'll write about 50 pages or 100 pages or something like that you know banging it off banging it out and and then and i'll think and i'll think this is good and then i'll something will happen and i'll look at it again and i'll realize i'll actually know it's not good this is not yeah. good and i'll have to go back to the beginning and maybe i can salvage some of the things that i've already written um but essentially start again and that's so that's a thing that happens to me in the in the course of it for sure i always when i get to the very end i always need to go back to the beginning and write a little bit more at the beginning because i'll tend mm. to just to get started, I'll sort of just start writing, knowing that it's not, you know, really like necessarily, you know, good, good writing, but just, just to get started. So then, and then I'll keep going to the end. So then I always have to go back to the beginning to fix it and to make it better. Um, I mean, you know, then throughout the book, I have to make it better, but, but it's, um, 
Yeah, that 20,000 word. Yeah, that's a kind of like that. Yeah, or, or yeah, when you've been doing it for so long and you realize, oh, wow, I've only got 20,000 words. Yes, and I should, yeah. I'm only like, a, you know, a quarter or a third of the way through this thing. And I've run out of things for my characters to do or to think or to say, like, maybe I should just write a short story, <laughs> but it's too long for a short story. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> Or even worse when you've done 60,000, even worse when you've done 60,000 words and they're still in the, they still haven't left the house, you know, it's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that connective tissue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, yeah. She knows she has to go to a meeting. So it's like, okay, yeah. She puts her shoes on, she puts her jacket on, she unlocks yeah. the shoes. You know, why am I writing all this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just one last one. What are you, so what, ne no pressure, but what next? What next? Yeah. Well, I'm actually strangely enough um, because we were talking about, I, I was talking about how I can only write novels, but now I'm actually thinking of trying to write some kind of nonfiction um, sort of about um, writing like about writing, about writing, about what, this is just going to be a short little thing. And then I'll, and then I'll, uh, and then I want to write a, a different novel after that. But, but, um, but just kind of what it means to me, like how it really has like really, um, you know, genuinely um, kept me alive. And so, um, and, and, and I talked a little bit about the futility often that I feel and, and, um, you know, when it comes to writing and, uh, and sometimes when it comes to, you know, li life itself, I mean, you know, you have to, and just sort of my relationship with words and language and, but, but, but not done in any kind of heavy handed way and um, not done in a sort of educating, educate, it's not like, oh, here's how you write or here's, you know, but more in a sort of homage in, in a sense and, you know, kind of like, why write, you know, but mm. just, this will just be a little, pamphlet yeah. <laughs> well i'm i'm here for it definitely <laughs> thank you so much um i'm just going to give the book a big thing everybody who's here has already read this fight night it's absolutely brilliant if you're watching on youtube now go away and buy it um and i look just a little quick word about the next book club for everybody who's here july's book club is this is going to end in tears by lisa klausman um, I'll be emailing over the weekend about that. So, uh, thank you so much, Miriam. You've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you for giving us all your time. Thank you. Well, thank Good you work. for having me on the program. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.